26 years ago tomorrow, I was walking across the campus at Wesley Theological Seminary uh, when I saw my friend Darren talking to a young woman in front of Strawn's uh, dormitory. And so uh, as I passed by, I, I knew who Linda Patterson was, but I had not officially met her. And so I decided, bravely as, uh, uh, it wasn't brave, uh, I walked up and I said, hey, Darren, who is this you're talking to? As if I didn't know, we got introduced, and as we might say, the rest is history. 20, 25 and a half years later, you know, we've been married and, you know, have two beautiful children and the world is a different place. Uh, each one of those moments in life when we take a step out in trust, we enter into a world that might or might not be filled with, uh, you know, varying degrees of chaos. Every new relationship, every new job, every new place we move to, it feels just a little chaotic. Chaotic is everywhere. Chaotic feelings, chaotic uh, uh, ways of dealing with the world and things are changing so quickly it's hard to know when you get up after you went to bed last night if the world will be the same place that you went in you know when you went to sleep last night uh, what might have changed and so it is that it seemed to me as we we're talking about surfing chaos and will be for several more weeks that it might be good to talk about an aspect that I think uh, will help us in the midst of of chaos, and that is, that is trust. Trust, it, it sounds easy. It sounds easy. You know, we talk about trusting other people. But, you know, you begin to trust someone, and then they let you down. Or you begin to trust God uh, only to be concerned that somehow you are going to have to make a big step in faith. Take, for instance, our guy today, Abram. Now, you might know him more familiarly as Abraham. That's, his name gets changed later on. He starts off with the name Abram. And he's minding his own business with the rest of his family living in one place when he hears a word from the Lord. We're looking today at the beginning of Genesis chapter 12. And here, is, you know, we've, up to this moment, we found out that Abram has got two brothers, uh, one of them predeceases him, and it's one of his brother's sons, Lot, that goes on this journey, ultimately goes on this journey with him, but we'll catch that a little later on. So beginning with the first verse of chapter 12, I want to read to you uh, in Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, leave your land, your family, and your father's household for the land that I will show you. Now, right then and there is the reason most of us do not jump on board with trusting God. We're afraid of what God's going to ask. I would like to trust that God guy, but I don't know what God's going to ask for. It may require, it, and, and look, you know, I want specifics in my life. Doesn't this sound like instead of bringing order into Abram's life, he's bringing chaos in? I mean... Look, I want you to leave everything that you know and go to a place that I'll show you when you get there. But until you get there, you're just going to have to kind of wonder and trust that it's going to be okay. Oh, that sounds really good to me, God. But you know what? I like where I am. I'm staying. So uh, because after all, in most of our lives, if you're anything like me, you know better than God. I have uh, known all of my life just a tad bit better than God about what was going to happen next and what should happen next and what way I should go. I was absolutely sure that I wasn't supposed to do this thing that I'm doing right now, that there were bigger, better, more important things to do with my life. There was a time, thank God, that I didn't, that I thought I was called to go into kind of politics, you know, that maybe I could be inspiring and encouraging and make wise choices and apparently sell my soul to the devil, you know, uh, which I occasionally think that's what happens. Uh, somewhere along the way, we forget what we serve and who we serve at. But the long and short is, 
thank goodness God broke me of that uh, imagined dream of power and more power and, you know, as if I really need any. Because the God I serve isn't into that kind of power, isn't into that kind of uh, power at all. So, Abram has already gotten this invitation. Leave everything you know, go out. It picks up in verse 2. I will make of you a great nation and will bless you. Now, you need to know something about Abram. He's 75 years old. At this point in the conversation, I'm going to make of you a great nation. And, you know, the promises, and I'm going to bless you. I will make your name respected, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. No pressure. No pressure at all. You know, it's like, step out in faith, go somewhere you don't know, uh, and, because through you I want to bless everybody else. But, no. I, if you stay there, I guess no families in the earth are going to get that blessing. No pressure. No pressure at all. So, as we know, Abram left just as the Lord told him, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. That takes a tremendous amount of trust. It takes a tremendous amount of trust. Now, I, I don't know how much you know about Abram, who ultimately gets the name Abraham, which, you know, uh, or Abraham, but uh, that, you know, that means father of many, father of nations. And it's what's interesting is Abraham is considered the father of Judaism and Christianity, and even our Islamic sisters and brothers consider him to be a father, uh, at, you know, a key player in this whole journey of what faith happened. He becomes a blessing, and uh, that's exactly what God hopes for all of us. But the first step towards that is taking that step in trust. And I have to tell you, sometimes taking that step in trust actually leads us into, at least in our own minds, a temporary moment of chaos rather than away from it. it I'd love to tell you that as soon as you start trusting God, all the chaos goes away. I think I'm trying to learn to trust God more and more every day, but unfortunately, uh, chaos keeps coming my way. Little unexpected realities. I mean, the truth is, uh, we have courted chaos at St. James because we trusted God. If you think about it, uh, you know, and if some of you who've been around for a while, five years ago, we had a perfectly fine building somewhere else. 1,000 feet that way, 500 feet that way. We had a perfectly good building. It was starting to come apart, but we had a perfectly good building and a perfectly good location, and we began to feel this calling in our heart that we were supposed to trust God to do something else. Now, it came in the form of the district coming to us and saying, we're thinking that, you know, there's a whole section of Alexandria without a church. The whole Cameron Station area doesn't have a church. You, you, we, we want you to go there. And we thought, oh, this sounds exciting, it sounds scary, but you know, you, initially you get the excitement. I think God wires us so that we get excited first, so that we do crazy things like get married. I, I don't, you know, I mean, I met Linda, and I was really excited, and you know, I'll just tell you, after 25 years of marriage, I'm still excited most of the time, but there are days that are just like, uh, you know, we're doing this thing. You know, uh, I'll see you later when you get home, you know, whatever. Yep. She maybe has more days of like that than I do. Because of living with me is, uh, is no joy ride. But uh, the, the truth is that the excitement draws us in. And so the excitement sounded good, and we started the process. And selling commercial property and getting approvals and doing dances with all sorts of people and and all of the negotiations that go into that, and all of the yeses you've got to get boxes checked to is just crazy. And it was chaotic and messy and yucky. And finally, the building sold, and there was a pile of money in the bank and no place for us to hang out, <laughs> except the Hermitage opened their door and said, hey, come over here and hang out with us. You can have some space on Sunday morning. So some intrepid members of St. James said, sure, we'll come and set up take two hours every Sunday morning to set up, and then an hour of worship, and then another hour and a half to take down. Sure, we don't have anything better to do with our Sundays. Never mind NFL, you know, fortunately when we moved. No, we actually moved right in the middle of the NFL season, you know, so uh, if, as long as you didn't have a one o'clock game, you were fine. 
Uh, and depending upon what team you were rooting for, you didn't need to see until the last five minutes anyway. So uh, guess what? They lost again. So uh, I'm not mentioning the Redskins out loud. I promised. I promised I would. So no one knew who I was talking about. No one knew. The, the truth of the matter is we were in the midst of that chaos and we were not finding the place that we were sure God had called us to. We were not finding a place in Cameron Station or anywhere near Cameron Station. It was just crazy. And believe me, crazy gets amplified when you're the leader of the group that actually led everyone into the middle of nowhere. You know, uh, because everyone's crazy us gets rubbed onto you. Everyone comes in. So, James, what have you found? Have you found something? Have you seen something? Have you been there? Where, where is it? What's going on? James, can you tell me? What's happening? When is it going to change? When are we going to get someplace? Uh, can you do it tomorrow? Can we do it next week? Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we do it? Shut up. <laughs> I'll tell you when we're moving. When I say so, don't ask again. And then the next week. Can we move? Can we move? Is it there? Okay. Because you took turns. I don't know. Did you tag team? Did some of you say to each other, this week you get to ask James? I didn't ever tell anybody to shut up. Only in my brain. You know, uh, did you feel it? Well, that's probably not good. I'm supposed to be a non-anxious presence in the community. I, I think I was starting to get anxious. Maybe God sensed it or whatever, but we weren't finding a place. And as you all know the story, or many of you know the story, we, I made a right-hand turn one day because I was going to look at the hole in the ground where St. James used to be, and lo and behold, this church had been on the market, All Nations Church of God had been on the market for two days, and they already had four offers on the property, and I didn't think anything of it, I just drove on by, and uh, went home. Wednesday is my D&D &D night, I go and play Dungeons and Dragons, so that's all I was thinking about is whether I was going to be killed by a dragon tonight. So, uh, you know, God has got a lot, a lot on God's plate when God is dealing with me. So, that night I couldn't sleep. I got up the next morning, I went to have coffee with a friend uh, who is never late and who was for one time late. So I thought to myself, maybe I'll just call my broker and say, can you find out about that church on Fillmore Avenue? And we prayed and we discerned that maybe God really wanted us on the west end of Alexandria, that we were perfectly fine where we were, just maybe in a more compact space, that God had a whole different plan for us in a different direction. And so then we had to trust God again and move into this space, only not move in immediately because we bought the space. We closed on September 30th of last year. And then we went through a process of renovation that got delayed by the city because regulation. It's their job, I guess. They sent the forms to the wrong section. It took an extra six weeks to get approved to do anything to the building. They finally started the process and we were able to move in finally in February. And now we know this is where God wanted us to be. But in between, there was just a wicked lot of chaos. It was just a wicked pile of it all the time. I felt chaotic. The only thing that kept me anchored, I will tell you truthfully, and Linda can tell you because she sees me when I'm at home, um, that my trust in God never wavered. I might have been crazy at moments, but my trust in God never wavered. That my life of centering prayer, you know, I only discovered centering prayer like five years ago. I didn't even know what centering prayer was, and it was about five year, years ago that I started doing centering prayer, and it became my anchor. You know, I did intercessory prayer most of my life, but this quiet before God that kept my heart quiet and that kept me quiet, and it might have been my only 20 minutes of non-craziness in the entire day, <laughs> but it was my 20 minutes with God, and so I never stopped trusting God, and that's how I made it through the chaos. And the truth is, trust is a big issue in all of our lives. Trusting God is the way we make it through chaos. But God has also, you see, we, we're Christians, just, just in case, or at least we're on that journey somewhere along the way. And as Christians, we have a weird kind of theology that a lot of churches don't. And ours is, we have, I promised you no theological terms, but I'm going to use one anyway. 
we have an incarnational theology. We believe that God showed us what it looks like to be truly human by becoming human. Not by handing us a tablet with a list, but by actually becoming human and showing us what love looks like in person and inviting us to follow in that same pattern in the way we live. We are meant not only to trust God, but to learn to trust each other. Because in some kind of weird way, according to Jesus, when we trust God, when we love God, we're loving each other. And when we love each other, we're somehow loving God. It's not that people are exactly the same as God or that God is exactly the same as people, but somehow we're all part of this movement God is creating in the entire universe of love. And so when we trust God, we're learning to take risks and trust each other. Now I have to tell you that in my 25 years of being married to my wife, that because of my trust in her, we have made it through some tough times. Some tough times. There was a moment when she lost her job. And then in a rush, she took another job. Only that job stank. <laughs> you know, she would tell you she could give you a much better deal, but it stank. I could tell she hated it. You know, crack-headed boss, I just want to <laughs> tell you, you know, you know, uh, and, and Linda finally stood up, and that was the end. <laughs> you can't treat other people like you treat them. Nope, but you're gone. <laughs> so I'll do what I want to do. And that's what happened. And then she became the executive director of Gordon Community Action Center because I think that's where God wanted her to be. But there was a period in there where she was afraid to tell me, and I was afraid to say her, that we might lose our retirement home in West Virginia because we weren't sure we could meet the payments without that next paycheck. Where was that going to come from? That required a lot of trust not only in God but in each other. Holding on. Holding on. Now see, I think in the best of all possible worlds, we'd learn to see beyond all the facades and false faces we put up to protect ourselves and learn to trust each other for who we really are. Now that, that sounds so much easier. When I say it as a sentence, it doesn't just sound easy. I'm just going to put down my face. You're going to see me for who I am, and you're going to love that. But that's not the way I feel inside. It causes great anxiety for me to drop my face, because sometimes I'm not even sure what's my face and what's not my face. When I look in the mirror, am I seeing me, or am I seeing the guy in the mirror? Uh, that I've created over a lifetime so I'm protected when I'm hanging out with other people. This community, the reason why we do this thing as a community, yes, you can worship God perfectly fine under a tree somewhere and be connected to God and stuff like that, but part of the reason why we do this in community is because we have to learn to trust each other, and the only way you're going to learn to trust each other is, is, is in the grand experiment that God has given us called life. We have to learn to trust and lean on one another. In the good times when we're celebrating, woo, we have got a building and we love the way it looks. And in the bad times, we don't have a building. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going on. We've got to learn to trust and lean on one another in the midst of all of this. And that is the only way we make it through chaos. Is learning to trust each other on this journey of faith. Now, it's, it's a hard business. Because people are going to let you down. I can promise you, I believe this at the core of my soul, God will never let you down. You just may be surprised by what God has for you. <laughs> you may have thought you knew what God was calling you to do. Abram, really, God just gave it to him straight. Dude, I need you to leave. I'm not telling you where. I'll show you when you get there. That's like Linda when she gets in the car with me and we're driving somewhere and I refuse to look at a map. I will show you where we're going. We will get there. Uh, honey, I'm going to get ways going right now. I do not want to hear from Thomas. Do not let Thomas talk to me. That's her voice on ways. I like Natalie myself. She has a beautiful British accent. Natalie talks to me, but only when I really want to know where I'm going. Otherwise, I like to just show up. Um, but, you know, what kind of trust does it take to say, God, I trust you enough to just go where you say? And I know you'll show me. And I'll know when it's right. 
That's kind of a discernment. That's the difference between making decisions and discerning what God really wants for your life. But it requires trust. One of the most powerful things about the person of Abraham, and I encourage you, start in chapter 12 and read the story of Abram. God and Abram, until he becomes Abraham, and even after he's Abraham, chat all the time. They just talk to each other. It's like a, a relationship of trust. Abraham is so sure that he's got a connection with God that when God says, you, you know, s- send some messengers through, three messengers uh, that stop off at the tent uh, that, and on their way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, Abram says, listen, God, dude, if you find a hundred righteous people, will you not destroy the city? And God says, on it, God, I'll find a hundred. Abram says, well, I don't think you're going to find a hundred. Let's try 50. How about 50? What about 50? What about 10? He just keeps negotiating with God. That's the kind of open, kind of chatty relationship he had with God. It's a beautiful, beautiful relationship, and it involves a great deal of trust. Now, your assignment for the week. This is where we always come to the next steps. Your assignment for the week is to figure out who in this world you trust. And who in the world beyond, perhaps, you trust. But you see, I'm I'm not sure about the world beyond. I really know God is here. The witness of the Bible is not about some world out there where God hangs out on some, like, on the moon and looks down from a kind of big throne that we just haven't found yet with the big enough telescope because it's always on the dark side or something. I don't know. God is right here in our midst. Who do you trust? If you find out you don't trust anybody, ask the question, why? What is it that has gotten me to a place where I can't trust? And ask yourself more specifically, do I trust God? And if the answer is no, then ask yourself the question, why not? Are you afraid God's going to pull an Abram in you and ask you to launch out into some bizarre place? Because that does happen. Speaking from personal experience, it does happen. And then, if you're still having trouble after you've figured out why and why not you don't trust, I'm going to invite you to do something that sounds oh so simple, but it's complex, and that is pray for trust. If you're missing something in your life, especially something like trust, pray for trust. And if you don't even desire trust, so you don't want to pray for trust, pray for the desire to want to trust. Pray for the desire to trust. Because then as that desire grows, God can use that for you to turn and say, okay, now I desire to trust. I still can't do it. Help me trust. I am convinced when you open yourself up to trust God enough to pray, and ask for the things that you need, that's when God can begin to use the trust you have to grow you to more trust. Just like when I met that young woman that I fell deeply in love with and still am in love with, 26 years ago tomorrow, on the same day that her grandmother, Grandma Brown, died, um, when I met her, I began to trust a little bit. I'd been in some really bad, broken, ugly relationships that made me decide I was called to singleness for the rest of my life. I even explored the Catholic priesthood and entering an order, a monastic order, because I thought that was where I might be called to. Well, let me just tell you, they're just not really fond of it if you fall in love with someone and get married to them for you to do that kind of thing. Change the whole plan. God in heaven. Actually, God right here, (laughs) changing my heart. And I learned to trust again. And God used that to teach me to trust God again more fully. And then to trust beyond that circle. Have I been let down? Absolutely. It's still worth every moment of trust. Take the risk. But begin by asking, do you have trust? And if you don't, why or why not? And then pray for it. And if you can't pray for it, pray for the desire to pray for it. 